Hi, this is Ian Davis from Forge Prosthetic Devices. Today I'm here with Joel Gibbard from Open Bionics, celebrating April being Limb Loss and Limb Difference Awareness Month. We're discussing some really interesting developments that are on the horizon for prosthetic device users. Forge Prosthetic Devices, that's your, how you, you're branding your, is it a company that, that you've developed? Or? Yeah, um, I actually started that uh, the year that I went into cancer treatment. Uh, a year before I became, before I needed a prosthetic. Like when I graduated high school, we had to do a, a senior thesis where I designed and developed a fully ambulatory robotic arm using myoelectronics back in 92. You were about own. 17 years ahead of me there, Ian. <laughs> 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 I did this maybe 18 years ahead of me. I did a similar thing at my, my um, degree as well. <laughs> Yeah, university. That's really cool. So I, yeah, I was looking through. I've watched like I've been a subscriber to your channel for a few months. I've seen the latest videos, but then I just sort of like had a look back through the stuff that you've done in the past, and I noticed that one of your earlier videos you had what looked like the eye digit, touch bionics eye digits. Is that right? I do have. I do have a uh, an eye digits. How did you come to go from that to where you are now? So. My insurance actually denied me uh, getting a prosthetic. They said that I was fine, you know, that fingers are essentially a luxury and that, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, that they're not medically necessary and that you don't need them in order to, you know, live a normal life. So during that time, uh, I started designing and designing and prototyping devices for me because it looked like I wasn't going to be able to get a device. Yeah. And you know, then I was working with um, Spectrum Orthotics and, um, you know, they ended up getting it through insurance and, you know, by the time that had come to pass, you know, I, I was already pretty well far down the road of designing a prosthetic. So, you know, essentially I wanted, you know, you know, this, I mean, because I mean, it is cool. It's, it's incredibly slow. So, which was was mostly the speed for you. So that was the big thing, right? So, for you, you found it. it you're getting impatient, waiting for the fingers to close, and having the mechanically driven action for you is this. It's the speed of it, is it, that makes it more usable. The speed and the grip force, but then also um, some type of HMI on on the back of the controller. So you can know what grip mode you're in. Yeah, yeah. We we've, we've got those in the hero arm. So we don't have a screen, but we've got a um, RGB LED on the back of the hand. Uh -huh. So we use. We found we ran out of colors quite quickly, but we use different colors and different pulses to indicate for your different things. modes. Yeah, yeah. So there's like. So then do you have three. a haptic drive in there too. We do. We have. We have. So it's it's two channel EMG. So we have one in each of the EMG sensors. Uh -huh. So there's um, and there's a little speaker in there as well, just a little beeper, um, which can make make little chimes. Um, yeah. We actually found people didn't like that so much, so we've disabled it for for most of the functions. So it only really makes the noise when you turn the arm on, but we still uh -huh. have the the vibrations to to give people a bit of feedback. That's cool. I was having a look at little look at your your design. There's a few things uh -huh. that super interest me. I think, I think yours is the only device that I've seen with a with the display action. Um, yeah, on, I have. I haven't seen anybody with display. No, I've not. I don't think I've seen that before. Well, I have my hand set up on an arc radian. Oh, you do? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think. Right. I don't. Yeah. I don't have it flat. It's on an arc radian, and yeah. because I'm using a wiffle tree device, it allows yeah. for when I'm grabbing something that is flat. Even though it's set up on a curve, it allows it to grab a flat plane. And, and you say, and you went for a non-synchronous movement of the fingers. I noticed. Yes. They're not. They're, you well, don't because like when you pick linkage. up a cup, when you pick up a cup, you know, of course, you want to post off of the pinky. You know, you actually set the cup down on the pinky, on the side of the pinky. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we we, we so we did the same. This is what I was, I was noticing. The, there's some design similarities. So if I just close some of the, hang on a second, let me just change the grip mode. So if I just close some of the fingers a little bit, I can show you the, 
it's not quite a whiffle tree mechanism because we've got more motors, but we do have the linkage of the fingers there. So when so when one uh -huh. moves, the other the other responds. Yep. And then we've also in the in the way the fingers close, it's 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 the same. They're not they're not synchronous. They they yep. have that level of flexibility to them. So exactly right. as you say, that's one of the kind of like what I have with yeah. with this being able to hold position, but then you can yep. adjust the positions of like the DIP and the PIP. It is, I mean, you, you've, you've obviously encountered that a lot, but that's something that we've thought about a lot in our designs. It's like that constant trade-off between speed, power, and then also, you know, battery life. And then on the electronic side as well, you don't want your motors to be too big when you've, when you've got a system like ours that has the, the electronics, uh, which I know you're all too, too aware of as well with your Mayo designs and your, um, what do you call those little buttons that you operate it with? Oh, uh, cap touch, cap capacitive touch. touch. Right. So, you know, the nice thing about a cap touch is it's single wire. You know, as, as long as you're grounded to the battery pack, you know, it works great. You know, and, and that was one of the one of the things that I had to figure out. You know, when when your cap touch stops working, your ground has gone away on your device. We've had enough enough of those kind of challenges with EMG, developing the EMG sensors anyway, same kind of problems with ground. Oh yeah, no, EMG, it's, EMG is great, but it is so finicky. You know, humidity, what your salt content is, how much you've sweated in the device, anything can affect how it is. What do you, so what do you think my, the future is in terms of control systems then? So like, like myself, I prefer to have mechanical over, over, electrical for for the actual motion like my eye digits it's great mm -hmm. but it's completely a blind touch there's no prior yeah. perception at all whereas with this hand where i have the contact points you know between here there and the front when i grab something between those three points where i'm mechanically driving the fingers I can tell how much I'm grabbing a hold of something. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I'm curious then if you, cause you've got quite a reasonable, um, you've got some range of motion, motion, haven't you, in your wrist? Yeah. Do you think if you, if you didn't, do you think you would just translate your, the range of motion that you used to your elbow? Every, everything that I've designed is, is driven around partial hand because I am, you know, a partial hand amputee. Uh, if I was transradial or, or, you know, wrist disarticulation, I'd probably have a completely different opinion. But because I have those two extra axes, then I design around completely different constraints. So you you mentioned the, you mentioned the, the degree of movement that you have in the hand. Does that yeah. limit the the closing force, or do you find you still can generate much more force with the um, with your partial hand versus the touch So I chose the digit. end point. So I chose the end point of my devices based on its most natural to point. Um, mm. And it, it feels like it's the strongest part of the sweep of my arm where it's straight. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that's where I chose to have the end point be. You wear that, it took me that, forever that to come up with that. It was <laughs> it, it was it was actually two revisions of my hand, two complete complete redesigns on my hand to come up with that. Like the hand, two hands before this was was completely three D was completely resin printed in tough resin. Have you have you used SLS machines very much or um, the the P twelve nylon from the, the, uh, I've, I've done nylon, um, yeah. I and I would, and nylon's awesome. It's just so so moisture dependent. You can right. seal it, um, so that's what we've done on on here. But yeah, I mean the the you're right about the the three D printing insofar as using the right the right process for the right parts. We actually mm -hmm. use three different different um, processes in yeah. here one, but this. One of the coolest things is this material that we that we got for the socket, which is um, which is a urethane. So that's FDM 3D printed, but it's it's uh, it's really flexible, 
and uh -huh. you end up with e extremely good layer bonding. Don't don't know why, but compared to um, harder plastics, it just uh, it just works really really well. And like the carbon twelve, you know, that's an incredible. That's an incredible material. Well, Ian, listen, it's been really really great chatting with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to shoot off now. Sure. Um, but I really really appreciate your time, and it's been just incredibly fascinating to learn a little bit more about your process and it's been awesome all right has thank you very much for the opportunity thank you bye bye all right see ya